for Allah alone, and that is sufficient for us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa baraka ala man la nabiya ba'da. And may Allah raise the mention of and grant peace to the one that there is no prophet after. Nabiyina Muhammad, our prophet Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi, wa sallama tasliman kathira. And may he place salawat and salam upon his family and his followers abundantly amma ba'du then to proceed inshallah today tonight this evening we will be completing this uh, series from the writing of the great imam shaykh al-islam ibn qayyim al-jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala from his book, Eretu Sabirin wa the Khiratu Shakirin, the series pertaining Al Bawa'ith, Ala Tark al Dhunub al Ma'asi, the motivation to leave off sin and disobedience. And in reality, the subject matter is even broader than that. That is a title that was given to this section by a Shaykh Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Muhsan al Abbad. And that he explained in the Mashid of the Prophet ﷺ. But as we have seen in our previous discussions, then in general it is how to strengthen one's patience. And patience is more broad than just leaving off sin and disobedience. Patience extends to being patient in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being patient in staying away from sin and disobedience, and being patient pertaining the hardships of the Qadr. Any of the things that have been predestined as a test for us in this life, how to be patient with these matters, how to be patient in general. And the patience of the Muslim is the proof of his Iman, is the proof of the strength of his Iman or its weakness, or its presence or its absence. And so the Muslim should look at these things that I mentioned here by this great scholar, Ibn Qayyim al Jawzi, rahimahullah ta'ala, and they are 20 things in number. In the first sitting, Technically, we've had four sittings uh, on this topic, but over this particular chapter, over this particular chapter, um, there are 20 things, and we, in the first sitting, took seven, the second sitting took another seven, and today we are going over points 15 through 20. So there are 20 things in number. Each and every one of these things individually is enough for a person to progress exponentially in their religion. There's not a uh, any all or nothing type thing. Any a person says, okay, that's complicated. I got to do 20 things to the off sin and disobedience. No person can take any of these things. They are very easy to understand and they are very easy to practice. Each and every one of these things can be life-changing for a person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to defeat our unfus, any our uh, harmful ambitions and our harmful impulses and urges that call us to destructive behavior. He says, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Al Khamisu Ashar, the 15th point. The 15th point before reading this speech is quite simply to look at how quickly life is going to come to an end, how quickly a person's life comes to its conclusion. And how quickly the person will depart from this world. Surahatu Zawala Dunya and Kida Uha. And you look at how how quickly this world is going to depart. And a person is going to leave from this world. He says, Al Khami Su Ashar, the fifteenth matter, Atafakuru fit dunya was Surahati Zawaniha, wa Kurbi in Kidaiha. Is to think about the reality of this world. And to think about how quickly it is going to come to an end. And how quickly it is going to come to a cessation. And how quickly the world is going to go out of existence. And the day of judgment is going to be established. And how quickly a person's life in this world comes to an end. فَلَا يَرْضَ لِنَفْسِهِ أَنْ يَتَزَوَّدَ مِنْهَا إِلَى دَارِ بَقَائِهِ وَخُلُودِهِ أَخَصَّ مَا فِيهَا وَأَقَلَّهُ نَفْعًا only a person who has no ambition, only a person who has no ambition and no aspiration would be pleased 
to take his time in this world, to prepare himself in this world and to gather things in this world that are akhas ma fiha, the most worth the most worthless things in it. Wa aqallaha nafa'a and the things that are of least benefit in this world as opposed to preparing to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and preparing for the world that is everlasting the hereafter. Illa saqatul himma a person who is preoccupied with what is unimportant in this world and who is preoccupied away from preparing to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and preparing for that which is everlasting is saqatul himma and they have no ambition. Daniyul muru'a they are a person who has a very small amount or a negligible amount of al muru'a of dignity and manhood. Mayyutul qalb a person who is dead in heart. فَإِنَّ حَسْرَتَهَا تَشْتَدُّ إِذَا عَايَنَ حَقِيقَةَ مَا تَزَوَّدَ For certainly a person's remorse will be severe when they see the reality at the time of death of what they have prepared and the paucity and smallness and scarcity of what they have prepared for their hereafter. وَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُ عَدَمُ نَفْعِهِ نَهُ and it will become abundantly clear to that person who had little dignity and little ambition and who was dead in their heart. It will become abundantly clear to him that he will not benefit from his life and what he did while he was alive on this earth. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا كَانَ تَرَكَ تَزَوُّدَ مَا يَنْفَعُهُ إِلَى زَادٍ يُعَذَّبُ بِهِ How much worse, he says, is it for a person who left off taking advantage of what will benefit him in this world in favor of that which will bring him about will bring about for him adab will be a means of torment and punishment for him a person spends their time in this world with things that made them miserable while they are alive and they are fi jahim as Allah tabarak wa ta'ala he said inna al fujara la fi jahim indeed the fujar the sinful and the wicked are in jahim Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says in his book, Adda'u Adda'wa, the disease and his cure, he says rahimahullah ta'ala, inna al-fujara la fi jahim, indeed the fujara, the wicked are in jahim and hell, fi dunya wal barzakhi wal akhira, they are in hell in this world, on earth, they are in hell on earth, they are in hell in their graves, they are in hell in their graves and they will be in hell on the day of judgment, in the hereafter. نسأل الله السلامة والعافية. Allah's protection is sought and well-being is pled for from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا كَانَ تَرَكَ تَزَوُّدَ تَزَوُّدَ مَا يَنْفَعُهُ إِلَى دَارٍ إِلَى زَادٍ يُعَذَّبُ بِهِ So a person will see that they have not benefited. They didn't have ambition while they were alive. They didn't enjoy their life and benefit from their life and at the time of their death they will realize their tremendous loss. How much more worse is it for, how much worse is it for a person who not only did not benefit but the effort that they made in this world is something that brought about misery for them while they were alive and after, after they died the time of their death will bring about adab, torment and misery for them. وَيَنَّالُهُ بِسَبَبِهِ غَيَةُ الْأَلَمِ And that will cause a person to experience the height and the highest level of الْأَلَمِ of pain at the time of their death. بَلْ إِذَا تَزَوَّدَ مَا يَنْفَعُهُ وَتَرَكَ مَا هُوَ أَنْفَعُ مِنْهُ كَانَ حَسْرَةً عَلَيْهِ So if a person, even if a person تَزَوَّدَ مَا يَنْفَعُهُ took advantage of of their life, and did things to benefit them in their hereafter. But those things that they did to benefit their self could have been better. Could have been better. They could have made a better effort to do what was more beneficial than it. Then that person will be remorseful. So how about a person who wasted every opportunity? A person who didn't come close to Allah, didn't repent before death, didn't prepare for the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, didn't take advantage to leave behind a righteous family, 
and all of the sorts of things that a person does with what Allah blesses them with of time and wealth and family and so on and so forth. The 16th matter, he says, the 16th matter in summary is to turn to the one who controls all things to help you against yourself. To turn to the one who controls all things to help you against yourself. al tija to take recourse to Allah. To turn to Allah. Al-Inaba, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to put your reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Ibn Qayyim, he said in his book, Madariz Usarikin, he said, Ad-Dinu Nisfan, fa nisfun inaba wa nisfun tawakkul. That there are two halves to Islam. One half of the deen, one half of the religion, is turning to Allah in obedience and gratitude and all the meanings of turning. And he's turning to Allah and he, in obedience, and turning to Allah with repentance and turning to Allah and he with gratitude and patience and so on and so forth. Inaba, turning to Allah, is the first half. And the other half is the tawakkul, putting your trust upon Allah to help you. Putting your trust upon Allah to help you. It's taking the means while putting your reliance upon Allah to help you. And that what you have set out to do, trusting that the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true. He says, Rahimullah ta'ala, Sadi so Ashar, so the 16th thing, Ta'arruduhu, ila man al qulubu bayna usbu'ihi. So turn to the one who the fingers, who the hearts are between his fingers. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala comes in the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ma mi qalbin illa huwa bayna usbu'ayni min asabi'i rabbil alameen. إن شاء أن يقيمه أقامه وإن شاء أن يزيغه أزاغه. There are no hearts except that. There is no heart except that. It is between two fingers of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. If Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala wills out of His mercy, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will set the person's heart correct. If Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, out of His justice, decides and if He wills and if He chooses, then Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will leave the person. To his own devices, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will set the person astray. This is according to a person's interest or disinterest, a person's focus or their lack of focus, a person's turning to Allah or turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person turns to Arruduhu ila man al qulubu bayna usbu'ihi, and that he turns, that he presents himself, he makes himself available for guidance, he makes himself receptive for guidance. And he presents himself in front of the one that controls the hearts. Tabarak wa ta'ala. Wa azimatul umuri bi yadayhi. The one who has control of all matters in the universe. Wa intiha'u kulli shayin ilayhi ala dawam. And the one that all matters are ultimately referred back to. And he does this consistently. He does this consistently. He constantly turns to Allah to help him. Fana'allahu. And you sadifa awqat in nafahati kama fil athar in ma'roof. This person may very well find that he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a tremendous opportunity for reward. And there are times that are special throughout the year, throughout the week, throughout the day. Perhaps when he turns to Allah in dua and pleads with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will find one of those nafahat. He said about which the Prophet وسلم, said, Inna lillahi ta'ala nafahatim min rahmatihi yusibu biha man yasha'u min ibadihi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has nafahat min rahmatihi. Certain times where his mercy is more abundantly available. And he causes his mercy to gush. And he to gust rather. To gust like a wind. And he and to reach whoever he chooses from his servants. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore to conceal your flaws and to protect you from what you fear. The Prophet said, Perhaps by a person constantly turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and presenting himself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For help that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow him to coincide. And he, for his pleading to coincide, Allah will allow his pleading to coincide with one of those sa'a, one of those hours or opportunities or moments. 
التي لا يسأل الله فيها شيئا إلا أعطاه in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never asked for anything except that he grants it. فَمَنْ عُطِيَ مَنْ شُورَ الدُّعَى عُطِيَ الْإِجَابَ Whoever is given the opportunity to make dua, then it is like he has already been guaranteed the ijaba, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to his dua. Allah will respond to the dua of a person. How Allah responds to the dua of a person is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But whatever the case, however Allah responds to the dua of a person, it will be great in his favor. It will be the most beneficial thing for him. Perhaps a person makes a dua for something, and something is something besides that is better for him, and Allah gives him that thing. And what could be better than the reward of Allah in the hereafter? Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give the person exactly what they are asking, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yudakhiruhu, as comes in the hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves that for the person to benefit from on the day of judgment, a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, perhaps a person may make dua at a time, showing initiative and having resolve and determination, turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps they will make dua at a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ask for anything except that He grants what He has asked for and that He respond or that He responds to the dua. فَإِنَّهُ لَوْ لَمْ يُرِدْ إِجَابَتَهُ لَمَّا أَلْهَمَهُ الدُّعَاءَ because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want to respond to the person, Allah would not have guided him to make dua in the first place. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the creation with causality, cause and effect. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not wanted to answer the dua of the person, He would not have guided the person to make dua to begin with. And so when a person finds himself making dua, Allah al azim a person can find himself throughout their life, the longer they live, the truer it is. They plead and they beg with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a situation where they have no other solution, in a situation where they have no choice except to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most desperate circumstance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer their dua, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things happen for them that are beyond what they could ever have imagined. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not wanted to respond to the dua of a person, he would not have guided him to make dua to begin with. Kamaqila, as a poet once said, Law lam turid nayla ma arju wa atlubu. If you did not want to grant me what I hope for and I'm pursuing, min judi kafi kama awatani taraba. From the generosity of your hand, O Allah, then you would not have awatani al taraba. You would not have. Uh, given me the ada, and he, the habit, you not have guided me to the habit of seeking the goodness from you. He says, وَلَا يستوحش, وَلَا يستوحش مِنْ ظَاهِرَ الْحَالِ That a person shouldn't look at their situation, and what seems obvious of their situation, and lose hope. And we know, as the Messenger of Allah wasallam was asked about the worst of sins, he said, أَلَشْرَاكُ بِاللَّهِ and تَجْعَلَ لِلَّهِ نِدًّا وَهُوَ خَلَقَكَ The worst sin is to make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the worst sin after a shirk with Allah is الْيَأَسُ مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ وَالْقُنُوتُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ It's a despair of the help of Allah and lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person should not look at their situation and say, I don't deserve for my dua to be answered. None of us do. None of us deserve anything from Allah. Everything that we receive from Allah is mahdu fadlihi, it is entirely His grace. No one is deserving of their life. No one is deserving of their children. No one is deserving of anything that they have. Every person is surrounded by the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the kindness of Allah to a degree that is beyond what they could ever imagine. No person should feel entitled to anything that they have. And so a person shouldn't say, I don't deserve that my dua be answered. You are the person who is most likely to have your dua answered for the general attitude that you have of realizing that you don't deserve it so long as you do not despair of Allah's mercy. Your despairing of Allah's mercy is so dhan billah is having evil thoughts about Allah and poor beliefs about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is a very destructive matter. But if your uh, sense of despair 
comes from your looking at your condition and you realize that you don't deserve anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then your state of maskana, your state of understanding your weak condition is the most likely thing to cause your dua to be answered. That is why, for example, the person's dua is accepted while he is fasting. The person in a state of da'af and maskana, when they realize their dire need of Allah, when they realize how weak they are, when they realize how uh, weak they are even in their iman, because when a person is fasting, they leave off sin and disobedience. Or they should. Or they should. Yani they, should live up, they should leave off sin and disobedience. Otherwise, they have not truly benefited from their fast, and they will not get the true reward of their fast. So when a person sees that he has a hard time fighting against basic impulses of, f- of food and drink, and basic impulses of leaving off sin and disobedience and so on and so forth, and he is making a meaningful effort. Then, at the time of breaking his fast, he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in dua, and it is ajdar, and he, it is most likely, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he said, that the sa'im, what is sa'im dua un mustajab. The sa'im, the fasting person, has a dua that is guaranteed to be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning on every day that he fasts, mandatory fast or recommended fast or an extra obligatory fast and at the conclusion of fasting in the month of Ramadan on the day of Eid he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the good of this world and the good of the next and to be protected from any harm in this world and any harm in the next he says rahimullah ta'ala a person should not despair from what seems to be apparent of their situation it feels though they don't deserve anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning. فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ يُعَامِلُ عَبْدَهُ بِمُعَامَلَةِ مَا لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ فِي أَفْعَالِهِ Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interacts with His worshippers. Allah interacts with His creatures, with His creations, with His servants. Subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that is unlike the interacting of anything with anything else or anyone with anyone else. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way that Allah deals with His creatures is not like anything that you can imagine. It is not like anything that you can imagine. There is nothing like Allah in His actions. Just like there is nothing like Allah in His attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not prevent anything from Him except so that He can grant Him except so that He may have the opportunity to get what is better than that. By being patient and putting reliance upon Allah, making dua and so on and so forth. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholds something from a person, the person has the opportunity to get what is even better than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withheld from them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may cause a person to become sick physically or even spiritually so that he may cure that person. So that a person realizes their weak condition. And they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove any type of sickness from them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not test any person with poverty except so that he may enrich that person. And the greatest enrichment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving the person al-qana'ah, giving the person ghina nafs, that they are satisfied with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to them. There are some people, they receive everything in this world. They, they have everything accessible to them and they are never satisfied. They are never satisfied. Whereas a person, if they taste the bitterness of poverty and the bitterness of not having employment or the bitterness of having a difficulty fending for their self and fending for their family or the difficulty of trying to get married and that sort of thing. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up for them His sustenance and His provision and they will appreciate it in a way that is beyond what a person appreciates if they were never tested with difficulty and hardship and so on and so forth. And that by itself is the greatest type of wealth that a person is grateful for whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them, large or small, little or much. He says, وَلَا أَمَاتَهُ إِلَى لِيُحْيَهُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not cause a person to die except so that the person can be brought back to life for an everlasting life. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, then the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does it is to give the person a great opportunity for what is better. Allah never takes anything away, never closes any door of sustenance except to open up one that is even greater than it if a person 
reacts to the test in the appropriate way. If the person reacts to the test in the appropriate way, then if one door of sustenance closes, another one opens that is even greater than it. To the point that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says this is how it was from the time that a person was conceived. In his book, Al-Fawaid, he says from the time that a person was conceived, مَا كَانَ الْأَجَلُ بَاقِيًا كَانَ الرِّزْقُ آتِيًا so long as a person's lifespan continues, then their sustenance is coming to them and it is guaranteed from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said from the time that a person is born in the womb of their mother, their targhdiya, their ghida, their sustenance, and their nutrition comes from the umbilical cord of the mother. And then they come out from the womb of their mother into a place that is more accommodating, a place that is... Uh, not tight and constricted like the womb of the mother is tight and constricted. A place that is bright and has sights and sounds and so on and so forth. And they go from having one source of sustenance, which was the umbilical cord, to two. وَحَدَيْنَاهُ النَّجْدَيْنِ Right? Those, you know, wonderful things to the children. Alhamdulillah, the sweet, delectable uh, breast milk of the mother. Right? And then... The child is cut off from that, as Al-Qurtubi rahimullah ta'ala, he says in his tafsir, that some of the scholars, they said, that one of the most difficult things for the child is to be uh, weaned from the breast of the mother. He said, ثُمَّ الْفِيطَامَ الَّذِي هُوَ أَشَدُ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْإِطَامِ And the Al-Fitam, that the weaning of the child from the breast of the mother, is more difficult on an infant or upon a young child, than striking it upon his face, than hitting it in the face. And some children, when you take it from the breast of the mother and you try to wean the child, the child is ready to catch a felony. Right? The child starts to act in a way that is uncharacteristic. You say, this child is a fool. Right? A child is ready to lose its mind, or loses its mind for days. Right? Starts fighting and scratching and screaming and losing its voice and vomiting because it's so angry and so on and so forth. But what happens? Once the milk is cut off, and that's the sustenance, then all sorts of alwan and anwa, all sorts of types and varieties of flavors and meats and fruits and vegetables and so on and so forth become accessible to the person. The person has lived their entire life and the time of their death comes and so long as they were obedient to Allah and grateful for the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and died upon faith, then what is in the hereafter is even better and more everlasting. And so a person's Sustenance is guaranteed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person responds to the tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in kind and correctly, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them in a way that is unlike what they could ever imagine. It's unlike what they could ever imagine. As good as they think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will do for them what is even better than their highest expectations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As was stated by Imam Ahmed rahimullah ta'ala, Kun kama arad Allah yakun naka fawqa ma turid. Be as Allah wants you to be, and Allah will be for you above what you could ever want or wish for Him or wish from Him. Subhanahu wa taala. Allah will be for you above what you could ever want from Him and wish for from Him. Subhanahu wa taala. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah taala. He says a sabi or ashar, the seventeenth matter. And yalamu bi an fihi jadi bain mutawadain that the person knows. That there are two things pulling him in two different directions. That there is something in him pulling him in two different directions. And these things quite simply, the first is the iman in his heart. And the second are the impulses of his nafs. And this is the reality of al-muhasaba, of a person reckoning with himself. is having a dialogue and an argument between the impulses of his self and his desires and the iman in his heart, making sure that his iman wins. It is a war inside of his soul. Inside of his soul there is a war, there is a battle that is being waged, that is raging, and and he being fought on a daily basis between the iman in his heart and the impulses of his self, the impulses of his nafs and his ego and his self. He says, Rahimullah Ta'ala, السابع عشر therefore the seventeenth thing أن يعلم أن يعلم بأن فيه جاذبين متضادين that there are within him two opposite forces pulling him in two opposite directions ومحنته بين الجاذبين 
and that the trial in his life is what happens between these two forces that are pulling him in opposite directions. جَاذِبٌ يَجْذِبُهُ إِلَىٰ الرَّفِيقَ الْعَلَىٰ There is something within him, iman that is inside of him, that is pulling him towards الرَّفِيقَ الْعَلَىٰ الرَّفِيقَ الْعَلَىٰ The heavenly host, to being from the dwellers of the paradise and to being like the people of the paradise. مِنْ أَهْلِ عَلِيِّينَ from those that will dwell in the highest part of the paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa jadibun yajdibuhu ila asfali safirin. And another jadib, something else that is pulling him towards asfali safirin, the lowest of the low. So there is something within him that is pulling him in his nature and in his intellect to being the highest of the high, to being in the loftiest of status. Love to Allah, love to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is something that is also pulling him to the lowest of the low. To act him like a hayawan al bahim or a shaitan al rajim. To act like a wild animal or like an evil devil. There is something that is pulling him to being an honorable human being, an honorable man or woman. There is something that is pulling him also to being like a wild animal or like an evil devil at the same time. The more he complies with that which is pulling him up, pulling his soul towards the heavens, the more he will raise in his station and his degree. Until he finally and ultimately arrives at that which is befitting for him and that which is dignified for him of the highest station. And the more he complies with that which is pulling him down, and the more he will lower in station until he arrives in Sajjeen. Sajjeen is the prison in the hellfire. Nasallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَتَ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَعْلَمَ هَلْ هُوَ مَعَ الرَّفِيقِ الْعَلَىٰ أَوْ الْأَسْفَلْ فَلْيَنْظُرْ أَيْنَ رُوحُهُ فِي هَذَا الْعَالَمِ And if a person quite simply wants to know where he's at right now, is he, if he was to die now, is he with الرَّفِيقِ الْعَلَىٰ, with the people of the paradise, or is he with the people of the hellfire? Then all he has to do is look at how he is in this world. Who does he find comfort with? Whose company does he find comfort with? What does he find comfort in doing? Where is he comfortable? And in what location with what people? How is he comfortable being? Is he comfortable having the traits of the believers? Or the traits of the wicked and the sinful or the disbelievers? He said, فَإِنَّهَا إِذَا فَارَقَتَ الْبَدَنْ تَكُونُ فِي الرَّفِيقَ الَّذِي كَانَتْ مُنْجَذِبَةً إِلَيْهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا he says, because once his soul leaves his body, then it will be in the company of those that it was being pulled towards in this world, that it found itself gravitated towards in this world, that it found itself most comfortable with in this world. The matter is as the Prophet ﷺ said when he said that a man will be with those that he loves. A man will be with those that he loves. As we know, Hadith of Anas, that a Bedouin came, he said that we used to be forbidden from asking questions during the life of the Prophet wasallam, and we were told to wait for the revelation to come to inform us about what we were curious about and he wanted to ask about. So we used to love when the Bedouins would come because they would ask questions to the Messenger of Allah wasallam. And a man, he stood up after the prayer one day waving his hands and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, a man may love some people, but never expects to catch up to them in their status and in their rank and how they are and in their righteousness and so on and so forth. And the Prophet وسلم, he said quite simply, that a man will be with those that he loves. A person will be with those that they love, those that their heart loves, from those that are alive currently and those that have 
died in the past from the believers. Those are the people that they are most likely to be with in the hereafter. Those are the people that they are most likely to be with in the hereafter, for better or for worse. For better or for worse. And so a person should look at those that they love and why they love them. And they should look at whether or not they are uh, gravitating towards the traits of the believers and the company of the believers, or gravitating towards that which is contrary to that. A man will be with those that he loves. Ibn Qayyim says, Taba'an wa aqlan wa jaza'an. By nature, he will be with those that are like him. And you have a similar nature as his nature. Wa aqlan, and logically, and he, is, and he will be with those that have a shared mindset. Wa jaza'an, and in his reward or punishment in the hereafter, he will be with those that he loved in this world. While he was alive in this world. He says, every person who finds himself drawn to some every person who is muhtamin bishay, who has any concern or care about a particular matter, will find himself munjadibun ilayhi. He will find himself attracted to that matter, drawn to that matter wa ila ahlihi, and to the people who are engaged in that thing. By, nat- by nature. And if he truly loves something, and that is something that has settled in his heart and settled in his mind, then he will find himself attracted to those that have shared interest and commonalities between him and them. He said, And every person will find himself flowing towards that which is most fitting for him, that which he feels most comfortable with. And Allah exalted be he the most high, he said, قُلْ كُلُّ يَعْمَلُ عَلَى شَاكِلَتِهِ Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that every person will do عَلَى شَاكِلَتِهِ According to that which is from his shakal, and that which is, uh, he will do the actions of those that are like him, and those that are similar to him. فَالنُّفُوسَ الْعُلُوِيَّةِ The souls of people that are عُلُوِيَّةِ, that are lofty and noble, تَنْجَذِبُ بِذَاتِهَا وَحِمَمِهَا وَعَمَالِهَا إِلَىٰ عَلَىٰ Then they, in their being and in their himam, in their ambitions and in their actions, they will gravitate towards and they will be drawn towards and attracted towards that which is most lofty. That which is most lofty. وَالنُّفُوسُ السَّافِلَةُ إِلَىٰ أَسْفَلِ And the low souls, the souls that will plummet in the hereafter to the prison of the hellfire, they will gravitate towards and be attracted towards that which is low and base. Alhamdulillah, if a person ever found their self uh, not a Muslim, any outside of the fold of Islam, before they accepted Islam, and one of the concerns that people have when you call them to Islam, and he is what life is going to be, things are going to be so unfamiliar, you tell yourself. And the things that I do, the food that I eat, the company that I keep, the cigarettes that one may smoke, any different things that people engage in, any things that people ingest, any the environments, the, the, the hangouts and so on and so forth, the person says, what are they going to do? I'm going to have to change my whole life. I'm going to have to change my whole life. And they start to leave off one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, and they feel better and better and better. And they feel happier and happier and happier. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them in a way that they cannot have imagined. And they find themselves spared from all sorts of calamities and afflictions. And it becomes depressing. Well, I've been Muslim for more than 20 years now. And I can't stand, even there are people that I grew up with that are Muslim now, alhamdulillah. I can't stand to take a phone call from some of them. And they call you up and they say, you say, you know, how, just generic talk. How is, how is everything back home? And they start to tell you any, who went to jail and who... You know, what happened to who and so on and so forth. And you're like, I forget that I asked. I don't want to hear that nonsense. Alhamdulillah, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed those things from a person. They don't miss them. As was said by Shuraih al-Qadi, he said that whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yajidu faqdah, will never feel as though they miss that thing. So harmful associates are removed from a person. Harmful partners are removed from a person. Any harmful wealth and means of earning one's income are removed from a person. Harmful dietary habits and uh, ways of dressing and ways of acting and ways of talking and ways of thinking 
toxic mindsets, toxic cultural patterns, so on and so forth. They're taken away from a person little by little. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors and dignifies a person and brings happiness to the heart of a person and contentment to the heart of a person. And they never miss anything that they left behind for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they see that this is the true progress and this is the true success in this world and the next. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to uh, retain our Islam, to progress religiously and to grow in our faith. He says, Rahimullah ta'ala, the 18th matter, the 18th matter is a takhliya qabla takhliya, quite simply. And it is that before you can inculcate something, before you can incorporate something within yourself, a better pattern of behavior, a way of thinking, or so on and so forth, and you have to get rid of everything that is in the way. You have to get rid of everything that is in the way. He says, الثامن عشر أن يعلم أن تفريغ المحل شرط لنزول غيث الرحمة Is that a person knows with certainty that emptying his heart of everything and his mind of everything that is not conducive to benefit and progress is a condition for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala falling upon his heart. وَتَنْقِيَتُهُ مِنَ الدَّغَلْ شَرْتُ نِكَمَالَ الزَّرَعَ And his freeing it and purging it of weeds is something that is a condition for anything to grow in his heart. So these are two things that have to happen. The first is that, and you have, just like if you are uh, planting a crop, or if you are planting some vegetables or something of the sort in a, you know, we're not farmers, so we'll say like the backyard garden or something, right? If you're planting something, the first thing that you have to do is remove everything that's on the soil, whether it be grass, whether it be weeds, anything of the sort, right? You have to make sure nothing else is growing there. If something else is growing there, then the space is already accounted for. And so, the first thing you have to do is you have to take everything else that's there and move it out of the way, right? The second thing you have to do, he says is remove all of the weeds that grow as you're developing what is in your heart, right? Anything that is not a part of growth, right? So as you're going through the process of developing and growing and so on and so forth, that you're removing any type of pests, any type of weeds, any type of daral, he says, which are pests and weeds and so on and so forth. فَمَتَى لَمْ يُفَرِّغَ الْمَحَلْ لَمْ يُصَادِفْ غَيْثُ الرَّحْمَةِ مَحَلًا فَارِغًا قَابِلًا يَنْزِلُ فِيهِ if a person does not empty out the space in the area that they want to grow something in, that they want to plant their iman in, which is their heart. If they don't remove what is harmful from their heart. Then, the غَيْثُ uh, rahma, and the life-giving reign of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will not reach the soil of his heart. To cause anything to grow. Like in Nahu, he says, uh, and it will not find any receptive ground. And they will not find a place that is that has kabul, and that is receptive, and that accepts the rainwater, that takes it in. And so the rain will not reach the heart, and the guidance will not penetrate the person. And it will go, as they say, through one in one ear and out the other. And it will just pass over a person like a Earth, like a piece of a piece of land that is sol, that is soldan, and yani that is firm, and it's just hard. The water just runs off to the sides, and it doesn't penetrate through the earth. He said, "Wa in farraghu hatta asabahu ghayth al-rahma, lakinahu lam yunqihi min al-dghal lam yakun zar'u zar'an kamilan." And if he removes all obstacles that are between him and guidance from his heart, but he doesn't take the time. To remove ad-dagal, yani the weeds and the pests and so on and so forth that may interfere with the growth of the tree of faith in his heart. Because Allah has compared faith to a tree and so to Ibrahim. He says then, in that situation, لَمْ يَكُنَ زَرْعُ زَرْعًا كَامِلًا Then his, then what grows in his heart will not be complete. And he will be naqs. And his iman will be deficient. 
and he will not be enough, he may not have an iman on wajib. And if there are different levels of faith, it is enough for a person to enter the paradise yawman ma, at some point. He may have to be touched, or she may have to be touched with the hellfire first. They don't have an iman on wajib. The mandatory level of faith is that which is necessary to enter the paradise, the awali wahla. In the beginning, when the people enter the paradise, are to be spared from ever entering the fire. So their zara, and what grows in their heart, may not be kamil. And when they come in front of Allah, ta'ala, their heart will not be salim, their heart will be marid, their heart will not be sound, and they will not benefit as they could have benefited from their faith, and their heart will be sick, and they may be under the wa'id of Allah, ta'ala, under the threat of punishment from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But ruba ma ghalaba daghalu ala zara, wa kan al hukmu lahu. To the point that what is interfering in the growth of a person's iman may be even stronger and have uh, a greater size than the tree of faith itself. Than the tree of faith itself. وَكَانَ الْحُكْمُ لَهُ وَهَذَا كَالَّذِي يُصْلِحُ أَرْضَهُ وَيُحَيِّئُهَا لِقَابُولِ الزَّرْعِ وَيُودِعُ فِيهَا الْبَضَرِ وَيَنْتَذِرُ نُزُولَ الْغَيْثِ فَإِذَا طَحَرَ الْعَبْدُ قَلْبَهُ وَفَرَّغَهُ مِنْ إِرَادَاتِ السَّوْءِ وَخَوَاتِرِهِ وَبَذَرَ فِيهِ بَذْرَ الذِّكْرِ وَالْفِكْرِ وَالْمَحَبَّةِ وَالْإِخْلَاصِ وَأَرَّضَهُ لِمَا هَابِ رِيَاحِ الرِّيحِ الرَّحْمَةِ وَانْتَظَرَ نُزُولَ غَيْثَ نُزُولَ غَيْثَ الرَّحْمَةِ فِي آوَانِهِ كَانَ جَدِيرًا فِي حُصُولِ الْمُغَالِ He says رحمه الله تعالى He said so the person he must be like the farmer who gets the tills the soil and gets the soil ready and he's waiting for the rain to fall he's waiting for the rain to fall rain being guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what a person learns a beneficial knowledge from the Quran and from the son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Allah and about the commands and prohibitions of Allah and about the reward and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is what a person needs to prepare himself for he needs to Make time, free up his time, free up his mind, remove any harmful impulses, so on and so forth from himself. I need to prepare to plant those seeds, to get his heart ready to plant those seeds so that the opposites of those things do not push out guidance. I need that a person, uh, by having iradat uh, sawa khawatiri, he says, and he says that when the servant, the worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, purifies his heart. And empties it out from harmful impulses and harmful destructive thinking. Then he plants within it the seeds of a dhikr wal fikr. Of a dhikr, of constantly thinking about Allah and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wal fikr, and contemplating and thinking about and learning the religion wal mahabbati wal ikhlas. And love of Allah and what Allah loves and ikhlas and sincerity for the sake of Allah. وَأَرَّضَهُ لِمَهَابِ رِيَاحِ الرَّحْمَةِ وَانْتَظَرَ نُزُولِ خَيْثَ الرَّحْمَةِ فِي آوَانِهِ And the person makes their heart ready to receive the gust of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the opportunities that a person constantly builds up, meaning the habits that are necessary to grow in their faith and for the branches of their faith to reach out into the heavens. And they wait for those opportunities at their proper times. Like the circles of knowledge, and like the day of Juma, and like Ramadan, and like the ten days of uh, the the ten days of the Hijjah, and the likes, and the day of Arafah, and those other times, throughout the days and the months and the year that are most beneficial for a person. Kana jadiran fi husul al mughal. Now, there's most likely if a person takes this methodology for themselves, that they will see the fruits of their harvest. Wa kama yaqwa. الرَّجَاءُ لِنُزُولَ الْغَيْثِ فِي وَقْتِهِ كَذَلِكَ يَقْوَى الرَّجَاءُ لِإِصَابَةِ نَفَحَاتِ الرَّحْمَانِ So just as a person is most hopeful that the rain will descend at the time that it normally descends throughout the year. A person is waiting for the opportunities. They know it's not going to rain in the uh, uh, summer like it rains in the spring. and It's not going to rain in the winter like it rains in the uh, it's not going to rain in the uh, spring like it rains in the winter and so on and so forth. The person knows that there are certain times that they need to take advantage of. 
There are certain times that they need to take advantage of on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and throughout the year, and so on and so forth. And they can be most hopeful for reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time that they should take advantage of the most that are most special with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fil awqat al fadila wal ahwal al sharifa. Those times that are most virtuous in those places and circumstances that are most virtuous. A person, for example, has an opportunity to make umrah or to visit Bayt al Maqdis or to visit any of those places that are love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to sit in the circles of the scholars in the lands of Islam, or those sorts of things, then by having made prep- preparation beforehand, they would take full advantage of the opportunity. He says, Rahimullah ta'ala wa la siyama, idha jtama'at al himamu, tasa'adat al qulub. He says, specifically, if the person has, throughout uh, the generality of the time, and he placed their ambition and their concern on what is most important. It's like the scholars, they say, for example, about the Laylatul Qadr. Some of the salaf they were asked, some of the sahaba they were asked about encountering the Laylatul Qadr. And they said that they guaranteed that a person who prays the Qiyam to some degree every night will reach the Laylatul Qadr. Right? Which is quite obvious, right? If you pray every night, to some degree, you're going to receive the rewards of Laylatul Qadr. But you know Laylatul Qadr is when? In Ramadan. And it is in the last 10 days of Ramadan, especially, and particularly in the Autar, in the odd nights, right? But it doesn't exclude the even nights. It's the best opportunity for reward throughout the year. So if a person is focused on just a random day, like today, there's nothing special about being here in the end of Jumad al Akhira. There's no any waqtun fadil, any outside of course between the Adhan and the Iqam and just general times throughout the day. But there's nothing necessarily special about today, right? If a person was a on a regular day, on a basic day, just take advantage of focusing on what is most important, thinking about the reward and forgiveness of Allah, and seeking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and seeking sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and focusing on doing what Allah has commanded, and staying away from what Allah has forbidden. Then, as the days pass, then when the opportunity comes about for a person, I need to be in a place that is better, where there is more reward available and more opportunity available or a time that is better like the month of Ramadan or something of the sort of the 10 days of the Hijjah then it is most likely it is more likely that a person will take advantage of something that is more important something that is more important he said he said especially when the hearts of the believers are focused upon a thing and the people are engaged in something collectively and that encourages you to be even more hopeful of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in important times and important places and so on and so forth. وَعَذُمَ الْجَمْعُ كَجَمْعِ عَرَفَ وَجَمْعِ الْاسْتِسْقَاءِ He said, and especially when the numbers of the believers, the greater the larger, and larger the numbers of the believers are, the more hopeful a person will be for mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, like for example, you have the gathering on a yearly basis at Arafa. A person who's never been to the Haramain, for example, and they go to Mecca for the first time and they see the crowds of people for every daily prayer crowding into the Haram like a sporting event in the West. You ever go through a downtown of a city, of a major city during a sporting event and it's gridlock traffic and so on and so forth? That's what it's like for the people to go pray in Mecca. And you see that and you say, this is tremendous. This is tremendous. You see the importance of what you're doing and the greatness of what Allah has guided you to and so on and so forth. He said that the more a person focuses uh, their ambition 
all of the time, then the more they will take advantage of these sorts of opportunities. And the greater the uh, opportunity is and the situation is and the more people are involved in it and so on and so forth, then the higher a person's hope will be and a person's expectation will be that their dua will be answered by Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will receive a great reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِنَّ اجْتِمَاعِ الْهِمَمْ وَالْأَنْفَاسِ أَسْبَابُ نَصَبَحَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ مُقْتَضِيَةً يِحُصُولَ الْخَيْرِ وَنُزُولَ الرَّحْمَةِ I'm going to skip over some of this because it's uh, quite detailed and we want to finish these last two points tonight. If you have the book, feel free to uh, go back uh, to read uh, more details. He says, التاسي وعشر, The 19th of the 20 matters is to look at the fact that al-na'im wal izul haqiqiyu fi dar al-baqa is that true bliss and true honor and dignity is in the hereafter true bliss and true dignity is in the hereafter it doesn't mean that a person in this world they will not be happy and in a state of bliss and in a state of dignity however what it means is that the true dignity for the believer will be in the hereafter is that the worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala realizes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created him has created him for eternality to exist and to live forever there will be no death thereafter and he has created the believer for a dignity that will not be coupled with any weakness or indignity وَأَمْنِ لَا خَوْفَ فِيهِ And for a state of safety that is eternal, where he will never feel fear again. وَغَنَاءٍ لَا فَقْرَ مَعَهِ And for a richness that will have no poverty or want connected to it. وَلَذَّةٍ لَا أَلَمَ مَعَهَا And for enjoyment and pleasure that has no pain connected to it. وَكَمَالٍ لَا نَقْصَ فِيهِ And all of this is in the hereafter. وَكَمَالِ لَا نَقْصَ فِيهِ And for perfection where there is no uh, degradation and no نَقْص, no deficiency. وَامْتَحَنَهُ فِي هَذِهِ الدَّارِ بِالْبَقَاءِ الَّذِي يَسْرَعُ إِلَيْهِ الْفَنَاء However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala test him in this world with al-baqa, with surviving in this world for a short period of time that is quickly caught up to by al-fana, by the end of his life. وَالْعِزَ الَّذِي يُقَارِنُهُ الظُّلْ And with dignity in this world that is coupled with humiliation. وَالْأَمْنِ الَّذِي مَعَهُ الْخَوْفِ And with safety that is tainted by fear. وَبَعْدَهُ خَوْفِ At the same time he is feeling safety. He is afraid that he may be disturbed in his safety. And he knows that this safety can very well be followed by a state of fear. Either in this world or either and the next, وَكَذَلِكَ الْغَنَاءُ وَالَّذَّةُ وَالْفَرْحَةُ وَالسُرُورُ Likewise, any situation of الْغَنَاء, of satisfaction, or pleasure, or happiness, or bliss, or joy, الَّذِي هُنَا مَشُوبٌ بِذُدِّهِ That he experiences in this world is tainted and polluted with its opposite. يَتَعَقَّبُهُ ذُدُّهُ And it is followed by its opposite. More often than not, and whatever he experiences of happiness in this world is going to quickly depart. So most people commit a terrible error when it comes to these things that are the pursuits and the desires of the souls that a person wants happiness and a person wants joy and a person wants safety and a person wants dignity and so on and so forth a person wants honor a person wants triumph a person wants victory but they seek that which is temporary as opposed to that which is permanent they seek that which is temporary as opposed to that which is permanent فَفَاتُهُمْ فِي مَحَلِّهِ they seek a temporary version of that whereas where it is least the least important and so they lose it in a place where it is most important and at a time where it is most important. And the majority of them don't even accomplish what they are seeking of those things. A 
person is after happiness and never sees it. A person is after joy and they never see it. A person is after safety and they never see it. A person is scheming for the things that they are scheming for, and they are, in reality, frequently only going to experience the opposites of those things. He says, And that which they do achieve of these things that they seek after is something that is very short-lived. And then they depart. The prophets and the messengers, the sole purpose of their being sent is to invite people to Everlasting and abiding bliss, wal mulk al kabir, and tremendous authority in the kingdom and the paradise for each believer. فمن أجابهم حصل له ألذ ما في الدنيا وأطيبه. Whoever responds to the call of the messengers will achieve the most pleasurable condition in this world and the most favorable condition in this world. فكان عيشه فيها أطيب من عيش الملوك. And their life in this world will be more enjoyable than the lives of the kings and the people of authority and power in this world. فَمَنْدُونَهُمْ And anyone who is less than them in status, less than a king in status, فَإِنَّ زُحْدَ فِي الدُّنْيَا مُلْكٌ حَاضِرٌ Imagine, with technological advances and so on and so forth, imagine in, the med in medieval times, and he, the person who had the most in this world, what life was like for them. What life was like for them. Yeah, probably people living in housing projects who have things that are more enjoyable, you know, heating and amenities and clean water and so on and so forth, the ability to bathe with warm water and so on and so forth. I mean, the life of this world is a trick. It's a game in reality. I mean, what people think is enjoyment in this world is, I mean, I mean it is surrounded with all sorts of difficulty and hardship and so on and so forth. He says, فَكَانَ عَيْشُهُ فِيهَا أَطْيَا مِنْ عَيْشِ الْمُلُوكِ فَمَنْ دُونَهُمْ فَإِنَّ الزُّحْدَ فِي الدُّنْيَا مُلْكٌ حَاضِرٌ Because being disinterested with what is harmful in this dunya is an immediate type of authority that a person has strength and power and authority over their own self. وَالشَّيْطَانِ يَحْسُدُ الْمُؤْمِنَ عَلَيْهِ عَظَمَ حَسَدٍ And the shaitan envies the believer for their attitude towards this world. And the unimportance that they have for this world, and the with the greatest type of envy, he says. And so the shaitan tries his best to not allow the person to reach true bliss and true dignity in the hereafter. Because the worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without a doubt, when he controls his desires and his anger, when he controls his desires, his passions and his anger, فَانْقَادَ مَعَهُ And he makes his desires and his anger submit to him. Submit to him. When the believer controls his desires and his anger and causes those strengths which are necessary for a person to survive. A person cannot survive without anger. And a person cannot survive without desires, but they have to redirect them towards that which is most beneficial for them. They have to redirect them towards that which is most beneficial towards them. He said, when the believer has control of his desires and control of his anger and uses it in a manner that is most conducive, فَانْقَادَ مَعَهُ لِدَعِيَ din Uses them to respond to the invitation of the religion and the motivation of the religion. Uses them in a manner to prepare for the hereafter. He says, فَهُوَ الْمَلِكُ حَقَّ Then that is a true king on the earth. That is a true king on the earth. That is a person who has the most authority on the earth. The person who has control over his self. لِأَنَّ صَاحِبَ هَذَا الْمُلْكِ هُرٌّ Because the person who has this mulk, the person who has this type of authority and dominion over his self, and control over his self, he is the, one who, he is the only one who is truly free on this earth. As Ibn Qayyim he said in his Nuniyah, he said, فَرُّوا مِنَ الرِّقِ الَّذِي خُلِقُوا لَهُ فَبُلُوا بِالرِّقِ النَّفْسِ وَالشَّيْطَانِ He says that the majority of people fled away from the servitude that they have been created for, which is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَبُلُوا بِالرِّقِ النَّفْسِ وَالشَّيْطَانِ 
And so they were afflicted by being slaves and captives to their own selves and to the shaitan. A person is not free who doesn't have control over his self. A person, who is not, a person is not free who is being manipulated on a daily basis by the shaitan. The person who has control over his anger and control over his desires and uses them in a manner that is most beneficial for his life in this world and for his hereafter and for his life in his grave, that person is the true king. That person is one that has true authority. He says, وَالْمَلِكُ الْمُنْقَادُ لِشَهْوَتِهِ وَغَضَبِهِ عَبْدُ شَهْوَتِهِ وَغَضَبِهِ Whereas a person who may have authority, may have uh, a, the status of a king, may have great wealth and so on and so forth, but they submit to their desires and they submit to their anger. They are controlled by their passions. They are controlled by their anger. They are controlled by any their desires and so on and so forth. Then that person is a slave to their anger and they are a slave to their desires. For who are musakharun mamlukun fi malik. This person in reality is a captive while wearing the clothing of a king. They are driven by the reins of desires and anger just like a beast of burden, just like a donkey is uh, controlled and driven. He says the person who was fooled and tricked and deluded, then his outlook is restricted to looking at that which seems to be richness outwardly and seems to be authority and influence outwardly. But in reality, in reality, it is nothing but captivity. In reality, it is nothing but captivity. And their outlook is restricted to their shahwa, their lust, and their desires that at the beginning are pleasurable and at the end result of the affair are nothing but remorse and regret. And the person who has true insight, who has been guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who truly understands what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent of guidance, the person who has true insight and is guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can change his perspective, Ibn Qayyim says. He can change his nadar, he can change his outlook and his perspective from looking at the beginning to looking at the end. From looking at the initial bliss that one feels to looking at the final ultimate outcome and reward that is guaranteed for a person in this world and in the next they go from looking at the beginning to looking at the end. And from looking at the mabadi, I mean the primary condition of something, to the awaqib, to the final outcome and result of that thing. That is the grace of Allah that He gives to whom He chooses. And Allah is the possessor of great bounty and grace. al wal akhir the last, the twentieth matter, and لا يغتر باعتقاده أن مجرد العلم ما ذكرنا كاف في حصول المقصود. Finally, he says is that a person is not tricked into believing that just knowing about these matters that we have mentioned, these nineteen matters that have preceded, that that is enough. Just knowing about these things is enough to attain and to achieve his goal which is to be more obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to progress. بَلْ وَلَا بُدَّ أَنْ يُضِيفَ إِلَيْهِ بَضْلَ الْجُحْدِ فِي اسْتِعْمَالِهِ A rather a person, along with knowing about these things, must make a meaningful effort to incorporate these things and to exercise and execute these things. وَاسْتِفْرَاغَ الْوُسْعَ وَالطَّاقَةِ فِيهِ They must give a meaningful effort and they must exhaust their capacity and their resources in trying to accomplish these matters. And the best way for a person to do that is to abandon their awaid. To abandon their awaid, yani that which is their norm, 
any of those things that culturally are harmful to, to, uh, harmful for them, those things that from their habits are harmful for them, and so on and so forth. فَإِنَّهَا عَدَاءُ الْكَمَالِ والفلاح, Because what a person has become accustomed to, and what a person has accepted as cultural norms, and so on and so forth, those things are the enemies of his completing his self, and his progressing religiously, and his, succeed, his succeeding in this world. And the next, فَلَا أَفْلَحْ فَلَا أَفْلَحَ مَنَ اسْتَمَرَّ مَعَ عَوَائِدِهِ أَبَدًا A person who just uh, continues, a person who merely continues with their awa'id, with their natural routine and their habits and their cultural norms and so on and so forth, will never be successful. وَيَسْتَعِينُ عَلَى الْخُرُوجِ عَلَى الْعَوَائِدِ بالحرب عن مضان الفتنة and a person can seek the following as a means to leave off that which is culturally harmful for him and is harmful from his habits and so on and so forth which is الحرب عن مضان الفتنة is that a person stays as far away as possible from any place where he thinks he may be placed to fitna it will be a trial and a hardship for him that will cause him to regress religiously minha, and that he stays and that he flees from that and that he distances himself from those things and a person will tell you that one of the best decisions that a person will make in their life is to look at toxic people that surround them and to leave those people alone to leave off environments that are harmful and to look at environments that are harmful and to abandon those environments not to connect your heart towards not to connect your heart to anything that is harmful for you. A person looks at their footsteps and they look at their whereabouts and they look at their the places that they frequent. And they look at the company that they keep and they stay as far away from anything that is harmful to them as possible. Qala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He said as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Man sami'a bid-dajjali falyanna'a anhu Whoever hears that the Antichrist, that the pseudo-Christ has emerged, let him get as far away from him as possible. Let him get as far away from him as possible. That is how he treats fitna in general. Any type of turmoil, any type of calamity, anything that is of a tangible harm for him in this world or the next, he flees from those things. A person does not imagine that it is brave, that there is bravado or courage that is involved in running to one's own and running to one's demise or destruction. That is the mentality of a fool. Courage is that which is coupled with intellect and intelligence. And anything besides it is tahawr. It is madness. It is madness. He says that the person gets as far away from turmoil as possible. فَمَنْ اسْتُعِينَ عَلَى تَخَلُّسِ مِنَ الشَّرِّ He said, فَمَنْ اسْتُعِينَ عَلَى تَخَلُّسِ مِنَ الشَّرِّ بِمِثْلِ الْبُعْدِ عَنْ أَسْبَابِهِ وَمَضَانِهِ That a person will find that there is nothing that is more effective in helping him to rid himself from evil than الْبُعْدِ عَنْ أَسْبَابِهِ وَمَضَانِهِ than getting as far away as possible from the things that bring about evil and lead to evil and harm and that are imagined to and, uh, imagined to and suspected to uh, result and that which is harmful for him. فَهَا هُنَا لَطِيفَةٌ لِلشَّيْطَانِ لَا يَتَخَلَّصُوا مِنْهَا إِلَّا حَاذِقْ وَهُوَ أَنْ يُظْحِرَ لَهُ فِي مَضَانِ الشَّرْ بَعْضَ شَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَيَدْعُوهُ إِلَى تَحْصِيلِهِ He said there is a very subtle plot that the shaitan hatches for every person in this regard and no one is spared from it except for the person who is extremely astute and extremely attentive. And it is that the shaitan presents something. في مضان الشر بعض شيء من الخير Is that the shaitan convinces a person that in order to achieve something of good, that they have to involve their self in something of evil. That there will be a positive outcome at the end of this. That the ends justify the means. That there are risks involved in getting this particular thing of good but if you were to carry out certain things or to be in the company of certain people or so on and so forth, that the shaitan convinces you and justifies for you that there is a good purpose in it. There is a good purpose in it. A person tells himself or herself that by 
contacting somebody from their past or being in communication with somebody from their past, that that person might be guided to Islam. And that Allah guides one person through you is better for you than all of the wealth on the earth. A person is convinced that by putting their self in harm's way, that some good may come about from that. That some good may come about from that. And that is nothing but a makida. It's nothing but a snare from the snares of the shaitan. He says, وَيَدْعُوهُ إِلَى تَحْسِيرِهِ فَإِذَا قَرُبَ مِنْهُ أَلْقَاهُ فِي الشَّبَكَةِ And then when the person gets close to that thing, the shaitan has convinced them, it's necessary for them to get some type of good, the shaitan throws his net over them. The shaitan, he throws his net and his trap over them. وَاللَّهُ المستعان. And Allah's aid and assistance is sought. We ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala for Al-Huda wa Tuqa wa Al-Afaf wa Al-Ghina. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala for guidance and for piety and righteousness and for self-contentment. And we ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to make us satisfied with what He has provided for us of this, of the things of this world. We ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to make what we heard hujjatan lana la alayna proof in our favor and not against us. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam. وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم